expire. Before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that this episode has a POAP. If you don't know what that means, there's a link in the description to rips.co slash POAP where I explain all of it. But just stay tuned for the secret word at some point in this episode, and you can claim your POAP using the POAP app or by DMing me on Twitter. But just be sure to uh, be sure it's within the first 24 hours because it is only available within the first day of the release of this episode. But that's it for now. Let's get on to the show. Welcome back to Starting Now. I'm your host, Jeff Saris. This is the show where I talk to entrepreneurs and creatives of all types to reveal the unexpected paths to where they are today. Today, my guest is KJ Singh of the Psyduck Solana NFT project. Um, KJ is a developer, just like me. We have a very uh, similar, uh, I don't want to say similar background, but both being developers, this was fun to be able to dive into sort of the ins and outs of using Solana and why he chose Solana over Ethereum for the various reasons, such as gas and whatnot. Um, but we dive into everything, how he built his team, his origin story, and um, he's a co-founder, so I don't want to I don't want to leave anyone out, but um, he's part of a three three people who co-founded Psyduck, and then they have an artist and additional people involved. But yeah, this was a great chat. So but that's enough rambling, actually. Without further ado, my conversation with KJ from Psyduck. I love Miami Beach just in general. So, yeah. and I was there once during Art Basel, but I didn't attend. I was only just, Ooh, I was on the beach, you know? So I, yeah. I know of it and I sort of saw the, uh, the energy, which is awesome. Yeah, and like the exactly. space. Yeah. But exactly. how was the turnout in terms of uh, the different platforms? So Ethereum versus Tezos versus Solana. Yeah, we, we didn't run into too many people in Solana. We did see a number of people with Tezos, of course, mm -hmm. uh, particularly by the booth, but it's really just Ethereum is is you know the <laughs> the flagship for uh nfts so uh got exposed to that pick some people's brains and uh also there was an event here uh last night i'm not art if you're familiar with them in oh, chicago no. yeah so they have a space in west town here in chicago and they had an event yesterday about web 3 e 2.0 layer 2 alternative so you know one connection leads to another and it's just been super awesome so attended that uh, they have another event on Friday uh, with kind of a live gallery that they go through. So nice. uh, just kind of getting back into the swing of things on a positive note, meeting new people. Yeah. Wearing a sweater, though. Unlike Miami, I'm sure you're <laughs> yeah. probably in shorts and <laughs> just enjoying the enjoying the uh, sun. But yeah, I need to get down there for sure. But yeah, so much opportunity, so many connections to be made because this is such a such an early space. And like everyone is still learning and progressing. And and like, I love to dive into origin stories and everything to sort yeah. of um, get behind the scenes and learn more about you. Um, but first, uh, just how about a little, uh, just little pitch, not pitch, but you know, like the elevator pitch, a little uh, sure. 30 seconds just about uh, Psydux and the project you're working yeah. on. Yeah, definitely. So we're Psydux. We are a Solana-based NFT community. We had a Mint Pass NFT launch. So our early supporters got a pixelated NFT and that entitles them to a free airdrop NFT of our flagship launch that will be going on uh, towards the end of December. So, you know, our collection sold out. So that was super awesome in a very tough market. So uh, we have a growing tight knit community. We have ducks as the name implies, Psyducks. And going into the origin story, uh, I myself started collecting, got involved in some rug pulls and really just was frustrated with, you know, why can I not find a successful project and diving into Solana in particular exposed me to how easy it was relatively since I'm kind of a developer, it was just kind of seamless for me to get up to speed. So uh, we chose Solana uh, because of that, but really Psyduck, the name comes from the Pokemon Psyduck. So mm, we kind of spelled nice. it differently. Pronunciation is the same. Uh, just to kind of have that nostalgia for our community of people that have grown up with Pokemon, myself included. And also we wanted to do something a little bit different from the typical profile picture sort of thing, because I think what we felt was missing was the emotion behind a certain uh, NFT, right? You just have this static image and that's you on Twitter on uh, what have you. So we wanted to 
add the emotion because I recall when it clicked in my brain for the brand, we were talking about Pokemon and really what happened was, you know, unfortunately my friend was going through a divorce and I'm just kind of feeling these emotions of, you know, it's a sigh of relief one day, a sigh of joy when things seem to be getting better. So it just kind of clicked to be Psyduck. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Especially when it, like when the name resonates with you and with yeah. uh, a friend or community, uh, really like it adds that much more depth mm-hmm. to it, I feel like, which is awesome. Like, and like branding and everything is like what we do and development and things. So I'm excited to sort of dive into even more about you and like sort of where you came from and how you ended up here. But um, yeah. yeah, like that, just having that thread of connection, having that nostalgia, having the different, checking those different boxes really goes a long way. And yeah. have you found the community to, um, I, I mean, I guess you found it, the community to be really receptive to yep. the project and everything that you're doing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, and we've made some iterations with our artwork for sure. We obviously wanted to separate a little bit from the actual art that is the Pokemon side up. So we had yeah. to kind of develop something that was unique and we're not trying to be sued by Pokemon <laughs> yeah. by any means. And so, yeah, I mean, it was really a struggle at first, to be honest. So we kind of put the team together late September, uh, started out with Twitter. Uh, my team members were kind of well-versed on Twitter, so we felt really good about it. But there's not a whole lot that Twitter offers in terms of advertising. So mm-hmm. typically with other kind of markets, you can rely on Twitter ads and other avenues, but NFTs, there's really not much. And the, the Twitter algorithm isn't ready for that, right? So a lot of the organic growth was really tough and we've since scaled quite a bit. So I think we're almost at about 8,000 followers on Twitter, but nice. um, Discord is where it's really at. That's where you get the kind of tightness and community and and folks have been great. They share, you know, our, our Discord and our Twitter and they're posting all the time and, and shilling for us. So that's been great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now we'll dive in more to, to the project yeah. in a minute, yeah. but just sure. to rewind. So yeah. who, who were you at a younger age, KJ? Like, were you yeah. seeing yourself as a developer? Were you uh, like, were, were computers always your thing? Sort of uh, paint a little picture yeah, for us. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Happy to chat about that. So For me, it was kind of a different kind of story because most of my life I wanted to go into medicine. I really wanted to help people. And I thought that that was going to be it for me. But at some point in high school, we had a course, I believe it was, I can't remember what course, but we were like dissecting animals and things like that. And it kind of just grossed me out a little bit. The (laughs) sight of blood would really kind of freak me out. And I'm like, okay, this is not it. (laughs) And like you kind of said, computers were kind of another interest that I had. And I didn't really know what I really wanted to do. So I chose kind of software engineering, which I ended up completing my degree in and, and have worked professionally for a little over 10 years now just kind of dove in and it was kind of tough, but it was one of those things that although it was tough and I hated it a lot of the time when I would kind of implement something that was tough, like the satisfaction that came, it just kind of made it all worth it as Absolutely. crazy. As it sounds. <laughs> so like when you, when you picked software engineering, I'm just curious, yeah. I was computer science and okay. the only reason I went that route was I was like, I like video games. I want to develop yeah. video games and like midway games back, like back then was still in Chicago right. and everything. And I was like, Oh, yeah, this is, this yeah. is an opportunity. Did you yeah. have a particular uh, maybe impetus for choosing software engineering over something else? You know, honestly, at the point, like I was just a dumb kid to be honest. So I'm no, like, same here. <laughs> what can I do that, you know, will uh, kind of really challenge me? What can I do? I, I consider myself pretty good at math. Um, I like computers. So it was just a combination of a lot of little things. I wish I had something that it was like, yeah, like that's it. It was just like, I think I could maybe do this. Um, you know, I don't have to go to school for like forever. Yeah. I can go to school, get, get my bachelor's. But and if all goes well, stuff. if all yeah. goes correctly, no blood. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So then, um, so then you've been working, you said the last decade or so in software engineering. Yep. So like yep. what type of uh, work have you been doing? Yeah, I've done a little bit of everything. So I've done some mobile app development, I've done desktop app development, and then more recently web application development. So that's kind of like my forte, but I do the front end and I do the back end. So really just whatever. So uh-huh. just want to try new things. And with uh, Solana got exposed to TypeScript a little bit, which is kind of based off React 
which for those of you not familiar that are listening, it's a framework created by Facebook, or I guess they're called Meta now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, So they, it's backed by them and it's used all over the internet pretty much. So most sites that folks are viewing online, it's probably built with React uh, and supported by Meta. Yeah. So now go in with your own NFT project because you're co-founder. So I, yep. I know you have like a decent sized team. Actually, could you explain yeah. sort of the team and the layout of that first? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there's myself and then two other co-founders. So I'm kind of the lead dev. So I've done kind of like half of the website development and then also all the minting and preparing the NFTs uh, for our launch. And then also kind of, you have to wear a lot of hats in this space. Oh, yeah. So doing a little bit of everything. And then I work with Zach, who I've known since high school. And he's kind of more of the Twitter expert, marketing expert, does a lot of the research on what's working well in the NFT space. And then Patrick, uh, who I've also been a friend of a friend. So he kind of runs a lot of our Discord kind of strategies. And then he's also kind of the developer that helps me maintain the website as well. And then, yeah, whatever we can do to support each other um, and just, um, I guess Patrick also does a lot of our community events. So uh, that's been fun. So we've done kind of this like pick them football, like fantasy football. So every week, whoever picks the most teams, right, they win. We've done like a music contest. So all sorts of like fun stuff as well. Yeah, for sure. And you said we're in many hats. I mean, that is the yeah. uh, the software engineers sort of life. I feel like it's like entrepreneurs too. It's the your problem solver and at the end it's yep. like what's the problem in front of me how do i get get it across the finish line kind of thing of course of course yeah and so have you done anything entrepreneurial like this prior to uh going full in on this yeah definitely so it, it was probably wow time flies but probably like six years or so ago so actually with my my co-founder zach so the concept there was um so everyone's been to a gym and as we know, gyms have TVs everywhere. And a lot of these TVs are just showing sports or news or just random crap that doesn't really, in my opinion, serve a purpose to help someone get better, right? You're in the gym to be healthier um, and better yourself, right? And, and feel good. So the idea that we had at that time was to uh, have something like a Amazon Fire Stick or anything you can plug into your TV. Uh, so Roku as an example, but having a device that would plug into the TV and serve educational content. Mm. So it would show you things like tips or snacks you can eat or just basic um, you, you, reminders to uh, wipe down your machines, put your weight away, right? So it's some of the things that are like, you know, just pieces of paper on the wall or things like that. Or obviously you can find all this online, but as Donald Rumsfeld has famously said, there's unknown unknowns, right? So there's things that you wouldn't even know to search or look into. So that was kind of the idea. And although we built a great product, what really hurt us was being able to get into gyms, right? Mm -hmm. There's a barrier of entry because these gyms, you know, they're big corporations and they have franchisees. And uh, unfortunately, we just couldn't break and, and get kind of any kind of decently sized gym to kind of jump on to our idea. So the lesson that we learned from that is the most important thing is the outreach, right? So that's where we've really focused a lot of our attention. And already, although NFTs are rather nascent, it, it's still super saturated already. So yeah. um, you have to kind of differentiate yourself and get the word out. Yeah. So did you actually uh, get to the point of fully fleshing out the product and like having that ready to roll? Or was it was it in that early stage? Uh, we did have it. We had a prototype and proof of concept, but it was also one of those things where, so obviously, as I'm sure you know, when you develop any kind of software, you want to get it to kind of like a POC kind of state, a, a proof of concept so that it's functioning, it'll work without just going over the top, right? So at least uh, in hindsight, that was one thing that we kind of did right where, mm -hmm. you know, we built something, it worked and it's like, okay, like now let's try to get customers. And that's kind of where it was challenging and for myself at the time, um, just cold calling, that's like, gets me super <laughs> anxious. Just picking up the phone. I remember I'd freak out and be super nervous. And it's like, you just can't control those emotions. So that's, it, it was really a struggle at yeah, that point. Yeah, for sure. That is a tough spot to be in because yeah. like, even when it's a great product, you can, you can pour yourself into it and be like, no, I, I fully believe in this. Yeah. It's hard to find a receptive audience at times. If, if it's not already there, yeah. you're not already in that ecosystem in some way. 
um or, i'd like to mention like it's important like who you know and what you know like on the show like I, I bring it up almost every episode just because it is they're two almost equally important parts because like obviously if you couldn't produce the product or create something great that's the first problem but yes. like once you have that if you don't have this side it's just so hard so hard to juggle everything definitely definitely yeah so so that's a lesson learned right like mm-hmm. it, it was frustrating at the time put a lot of effort put a lot of money into something and it didn't pan out but now I'm super grateful for that because that's the first thing that we tackled. And and now we can focus on also making the product good and kind of having that. It's kind of like a pie, right? Your time is like this pie and you want to divide it in something that kind of makes sense. And that constantly shifts, especially in the NFT space. It feels like a day is like a week, yeah. right? <laughs> Things change so quickly. So um, that really helped us become more nimble with this project mm-hmm. yeah yeah everything every little event in our path and like i feel like it all just culminates to where we are today like obviously we'll be yeah. different tomorrow next month next year but i think that's why it's really valuable to dive into the stories and be like no everything's not just uh up it's not all just up trends all the time like you have yeah. your your rocky road we all do we all run into yeah. the ups and downs so how then, uh, what was sort of your first introduction into NFTs and um, finding the space? Yeah, definitely. So I had heard of NFTs probably a year or so ago and just didn't pay a lot of attention to that. Uh, saw on Twitter and uh, the Board Ape Yacht Club, mm-hmm. obviously one of the most notable projects. I had a friend that had been collecting and and then another friend is collecting and they're making great money just buying it and selling it like 10 minutes later for a three, four, five X yeah. sort of return. So after you hear enough of these stories, it's kind of like, okay, like I probably should t- take a chance. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, the next couple projects that I participated in just were flops. And it was like, okay, like, do you mind me asking which ones? Uh, yeah, it was the gingerbread squad on okay. uh, Cardano. So that was like a direct rug pull where, and just to explain for the listeners, rug pull being they create the art, they have everything ready and you buy it. And then the team just kind of disappears Yeah. or in other situations, they don't even provide you anything and they still disappear. So it's pretty shady. Um, we have some recommendations we can probably talk about, but um, not to digress. Um, The other one was Eternal Beings, and that was the Solana project. So Mm. compared to the Gingerbread Squad, this was way smoother of a process. And this project was endorsed by a relatively major rapper, Lil Uzi Vert. So he was promoting it, tons of people in the Discord. And so out of all of my friends, uh, I believe there was five or six friends. I was the only one that minted one. So I was like super excited and After the mint, the price went up like a little bit, but that's kind of where greed sets in too, where it's like, oh, I've heard them make two or three or five X, like I'm I'm only up 30%. Yeah. But, and then that project went to like nothing because he deleted his tweets and it was just like, that was it. You know, the hype was kind of done. So uh, kind of experiencing those things, it was like, okay, like, how does this stuff even work? That's kind of where it like actually piqued my curiosity. And then just thinking about what are all the pieces that kind of go in to creating a project, right? Like you have to create a community. So that, you know, requires a Twitter that requires a discord that requires art and you need a developer. And I'm like, I'm a developer and Mm -hmm. I have a consider myself to have a good network. So reached out and people were definitely interested and similar to me had heard about NFTs and then the rest is kind of history. Yeah. And it's really good that you've had experience with people close to you as well, because yeah. like the previous product or uh, project, and then yeah. um, you said the, uh, the marketing person essentially is yeah. someone you've known for a very long time. Yeah. So like yeah. that's hugely valuable because you were able to sort of uh, hit the ground running, I assume. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And yeah, it's, you need to have a team. So I've also had a buddy that was, I would say rather overzealous thinking, you know, I can, you know, how hard is a Twitter? How hard is 
a discord yeah it's easy to create but it's very hard to maintain right yeah. so you kind of need to establish a team you need to kind of have moderators because although you can do everything it's if you should do everything right so as a founder i would highly recommend people to figure out what are the highest value things that you should be working on and delegate all the other things uh find help uh hire some folks and uh, you can find people online that do gigs. And I'm sure if you ask your friends and family, uh, we found super receptive people. And so just kind of go from there. Yeah. Um, so much to dive into, but curious yeah. from the Discord perspective, how do you keep yeah. it active? Because that's something I see a lot is yeah. a lot of projects, great communities, great, great people involved. But it, yes. unless there's a reason to go back, it's really hard to sort of keep that. Um, I don't want to say the hype because it sounds like it sounds like it's a bad thing. But you want people yeah. to stay involved in the community because essentially this is what it is. It's a piece of art for community access. Yep. Yeah. So I can tell you the feedback that we've gotten from our community. So all of the co-founders were very active. So I think that's probably the number one thing that people have given us feedback. And so we're trying to maintain that. Even if I'm busy, I will pop in there every now and then say, hey, what's up? How's everyone doing? Um, and kind of encourage people that way, making sure the mods are happy and they're able to continue you know, assisting and providing help. Because a lot of the saturation in the community people get confused, right? I think the average person probably is in 20 to 30 Discord servers. Yeah. So they kind of tend to forget like, what's on your roadmap? What's, where do I find this? Okay, I'm on your whitelist. I'm so trying to just constantly just reiterate and um, give people information. I think that keeps them around because I feel if people are confused or their questions are not being answered in a timely manner that you know also makes people wanna leave. So making sure they're kind of understanding what our goals are. But then also, as I mentioned before, having community nights, game nights, we have um, uh, stumble guys that we've all played. So we get on voice chat occasionally. Uh, we're trying to host a poker night. So finding ways for people to kind of come and engage, uh, having a pretty active Ask the Devs channel. So a lot of people are curious about certain aspects of Solana or NFTs and they're new. So sometimes it's hard to find an answer with a Google search and it's just easier to ask someone and kind of get their opinion. So we've done that. We're hosting Twitter spaces. So we try to bring in other Solana communities, even um, Ethereum communities as well, just to learn. So for mm -hmm. ourselves and then also having our community learn as well, because although we're on Solana, we're not tied to it. We just kind of chose Solana because it's the best technology at the time. Uh, Ethereum has a lot of gas problems currently, yeah. and it's just tough. It's very expensive for a newbie to kind of come in and buy a $4,000, $4,500 coin, even if you know it's a fraction of it with gas fees being, they're low right now. I think they're only 50 bucks, <laughs> yeah. but you know our NFTs are around that price and you would just pay that for gas, right? So mm -hmm. um so yeah, so sorry to ramble, but That's just kind of a combination of a, a lot of different things. Yeah, for sure. And I love that since it's a developer first um, uh, platform that you've built, I love yeah. that you're tapping into that to have the Ask Definitely. the Devs because you have you have the firsthand knowledge of Solana, which isn't as, um, I don't want to say it's thoroughly documented from like that standpoint, but from yeah. like maybe content creators, like people aren't making as many pieces of content about Solana and how to dive in. Like it's out there, but it's just the yes. scale is tipped in the Ethereum way just immensely. Yeah. Of course, of course. And it's tough um, with Solana. The thing that I really liked and the feedback that I've gotten from the community is it was so seamless, right? So you mint and then seconds later, you're getting your NFT where with the gas wars and other things, people burn gas and they don't even get anything. Yeah. And I even heard about Immutable X, which is a layer two alternative to Ethereum, which is trying to solve the problem of the gas fees. They're very new, newer than even Solana, and they're having tons of issues as well. I recall the Doge Pound, which is a pretty credible and well-known NFT community. They did a free mint 
And even though it was free, it was just a mess where people didn't get their NFTs for days later. And in our society of people being impatient and getting you know deliveries on their phone in, in minutes, I don't think anyone wants to wait a couple of weeks or a couple of days for you know an NFT to show up in their wallet when their money is gone, right? So um, I think Solana has been great for that kind of user experience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what were some of the being a developer first uh, yeah. group then? What were some of the first steps you took because you had to find an artist and everything that to, to right. bring in for the community for the yeah, project? Yeah, great question. So I reached out to Zach because I know that he has worked with a couple artists in his kind of history. So really relied on him to kind of find someone. And that artist was also pretty uh, well versed in NFTs. He had been dabbling and like learning on his own. So it was just kind of like a timing thing, right? Like sometimes things just mesh perfectly um but we needed to get actually an additional artist because it just was a lot as i mentioned like a day in the nft world is like a week so <laughs> people have their lives and they have jobs and it's hard to kind of just spend the little bit of free time that you have on something that you don't know if it's gonna pan out so we needed to kind of scale even our artists I realized I needed to get more help. So we added uh, an additional co-founder that I mentioned, Patrick, and it just kind of meshed and, and went from there. And we slowly got more help from friends that were kind of on the periphery. So not maybe as active as we were as the co-founders, but helping with our Twitter at times, helping with setting up our Discord and providing feedback. And then, you know, we were able to get to a point where we were able to actually hire some people and uh, just we've been maintaining it since. Yeah. So what was that uh, timeline then? Sort of uh, inception yeah. to uh, actual launch? Yeah. So late September is when I was dabbling with the idea. So I'm thinking maybe around the 23rd ish or so, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. And within probably a week, we uh, had kind of an intro call. So I pretty much kind of took ownership of presenting what I had in my mind of what I wanted to create with some of the things that I've mentioned to you with kind of the Pokemon thing. And then also taking pieces from the Board Ape Yacht Club, because I loved how they had their first generation and they provided this cool like uh, test tube of like creating your ape and making it mutant. And then it's more artwork that the original holders got for free. So I kind of wanted to mesh all of this, add this spin of this, you know, adding emotion to it. So it's not just a, a profile picture. And then the other thing that I haven't yet touched on is we have a community wallet. So some of the things that I mentioned to you for prizes and whatnot, it takes money to yeah. provide people <laughs> a prize. So 77% of our royalties go into this community wallet and that kind of funds all the fun stuff that we want to do. So kind of just pitch this. Um, and people liked it. There was, you know, more obviously ideas like, oh, we could do that and we could do this. And then we just started creating everything. We created the Twitter accounts. We, I secured the website domain and just did all of that and slowly just built things out. And yeah, that was pretty much, I would say first week of October is when all of that happened, the account creations, nice. things like that, starting to tweet, you, fig, starting to figure out what should we post. And it was really a struggle because I would say maybe it was the first or second week, but we probably had like 20 ish people like new followers. And we we're like, Oh yeah, 20 followers. And it's just crazy to look back because we probably do that in like an hour or something, uh -huh. you know, so it's just like getting used to that scalability. But the one good thing that I would like to encourage people considering starting their NFT communities it is very difficult to like start out, but you will scale exponentially if you're doing the right things. It just really, there was a point where it just like really rocketed for us. Um, and I, I would credit the fact that we did a lot of collaborations with other communities. So that would be my recommendation because then it's like, you're leveraging their community and folks from them are joining you and vice versa. And you're doing some sort of giveaway. So you're incentivizing people that they have a chance to win maybe a free NFT or something else, or maybe some Solana. And yeah, I mean, that's kind of our marketing effort and that's worked way better than Twitter ads. Yeah, that's awesome. So with the collaborations then, was it mostly um, like raffle, like entries for a side doc or sort of what was the approach there? Yeah, exactly. So for example, we would collab with uh, 
other Solana base primarily, just because it was easier to kind of have that commonality. So just reaching out, hey, we want to do an NFT giveaway and they would agree. So we would have in the tweet, we'd have a picture of our NFT, a picture of their NFT, uh, require people to like the post, retweet the post, uh, tag some friends. And at the end of like 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever the time span was, we select a winner and we would just keep doing those. And we got to a point where we were doing so many that um, promoters were kind of contacting us like, hey, do you guys want to help help me? Oh, nice. <laughs> like, we're not here to promote. We're just here to kind of grow our own community. So I, I would say that's one thing that's worked tremendously well for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I feel like that is one of the pieces that a lot of people, a lot of projects or even one of one artists, mm -hmm. they're stuck on because how do you bridge that gap? Even like some people who maybe have a like a good size following not yes. immense but nfts are so new it's like you yeah. might be coming in with a thousand followers mm -hmm. i mean three or four of those are in the nft space there's only a handful yeah. of us here like honestly yeah. like there's all it's huge and exploding but at the same time in terms of all social media there's we're a small percentage you know <laughs> definitely definitely agreed and i guess the other advice I would give is just try to find communities that are similar in size to you, because obviously it's a game of, Oh, you're bigger than me. And, you know, people, you know, feel kind of uh, egotistical about, you know, what can you provide, but we just kind of stuck to whoever was uh, around the same size, even smaller, because ultimately we're getting value. Like, I don't care if they get more out of the relationship, just be generous because you're going to still benefit, right? You have to look at what you're getting. If they get more than you, that's fine. Like it's mm -hmm. okay. And even for us, we reach out to more established communities where they probably generally would be hesitant to collaborate with us because they have a reputation. And obviously, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, rug pulls that have happened and scams. So I get it. Like, why would you risk your credibility over someone that is not yet established? But in those situations, we offered a few more NFTs or, you know, put up more and that still paid off in the long run. So sometimes you kind of just have to figure out where you're at and be humble about it and still go to, to see how you can benefit. Yeah. So since you were able to handle a lot of it in-house, like just your core team, like, and yes. um, you moved fast, which is yes. so important. Um, yes. Was there a big upfront expense to, uh, to investing into it initially? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I wouldn't say it's, it was an extremely large sum of money, particularly since there was three of us and we were able to divide a lot of that. Uh, so for example, our artist was really looking for some sort of upfront compensation uh, compared to kind of, you know, royalty, right? Each person mm -hmm. has their own kind of risk tolerance. Yeah. So we said, okay, so, you know, that was obviously a big expense to pay an artist uh, to mint the NFTs. That's a pretty big expense. So I think uh, Solana has been rapidly increasing in price to mint just because of all of the demand. So even mm -hmm. from when I was looking at how expensive it would be to mint in October to when we ended up minting in November, it like more than doubled. Oh, wow. Excuse me. Yeah. So, and is that for the smart contract it itself to be put on the blockchain? Yes. Okay. Yep. So that by that, I mean, um, each image will be coupled with a metadata file mm -hmm. and that kind of gets combined and it's an NFT. So that's kind of the process. So like I said, we created uh, a much smaller launch of 777. And that's kind of why we did a smaller launch because of what you just mentioned, because the larger your collection, the more expensive it is, because I think it costs a little over a dollar per NFT. Mm. So that in itself is, you know, close yeah. to 800 bucks and then all the other things. So, you know, we've paid promoters at times to kind of give us an extra boost so we can grow faster, um, having giveaways and events, because again, like no one wants to be in your discord always. If there's nothing fun going on, it's hard to entertain people. That's the reality of it. But ultimately I don't think it was a huge expense, but given that we had this smaller launch and that was the intent of it, where we're able to kind of get some money. And so now we're kind of uh, have this money to do our major launch. And we have the the money up front and we can just, you know, allocate that fully to the development of that. Yeah, I really like that approach. It's, again, risk tolerance. Like you yes. you sort of, you built the groundwork. So then yes. you knew you'd be able to deliver on the final product because that is something I see a lot of people do. Like 
especially over the summer, the 10K projects. And that is yeah. so much. And if it if you only sell a couple of handfuls, I mean, it's so hard yeah. to get any of that uh, investment back. Right, right. Yeah, and then the, the other thing is uh, I have day traded a little bit mm -hmm. in my past, not successfully, but <laughs> you know, I, going through that experience because trading options is something that you buy something and it's a lot of the value in it is time-based. So it's constantly burning. So you can pay hundreds of dollars for something and it ends up being zero. So if you're up, you have to sell like, and you have to get out quick. And that really taught me a lesson of don't get greedy. And I think what you just mentioned, I think people weren't nimble enough to see that the 10,000 collections that, that those days are long gone because that's when a lot of people didn't know about the space. There wasn't as much saturation. People tended to build more quality and actually cared about the community. And typically those people, because they were early, they were probably more knowledgeable because they'd been gaining this knowledge over time and just weren't looking for this quick money. So we realized kind of where we actually are. So I think a lot of that cognizance paid off. And yeah, now we're you know in a position that we can, without worry, launch our you know flagship and, and feel pretty confident about that. Yeah, and I'm curious then with, um, because you mentioned sort of cashing out, do yeah. you have, uh, just from your personal um, yeah. opinion sort of on crypto, have sure. you been sort of pulling out, like the project aside, like just in general, like what's sort of your approach um, with crypto and the crazy waves that, <laughs> that constantly happen? Yeah, definitely. So I was initially involved in crypto during the last kind of market bull run, which was 2019 or 2018. I can't even remember because of COVID. I feel yeah. like everything's a blur, but uh, got into a little bit of Ethereum, um, nothing crazy. So I have been a holder of that and really came across Solana sometime during the summer and the trajectory of that. So that was uh, a couple dollars in January. And uh -huh. it's crazy because it's like close to 200 and it hit a high of 255. So I'm very bullish on Solana. I know a lot of uh, the Ethereum purists are not seeing Solana as kind of the long-term play, more as like a stopgap as Ethereum kind of catches up on its scalability problems. But I actually really do like Solana as a coin. So personally, I am invested in that. I do believe that it's going to be big uh, in years to come because from a charting perspective, it is kind of following the same sort of uh, pattern that Ethereum was just a few years ago when Ethereum was also, I, when I originally bought was a few hundred dollars and uh -huh. that's kind of where Solana is right now. So uh, just the technology, because a lot of people don't know, but Solana currently can process just as many transactions per second as Visa. Mm, so wow. yeah. you know, that's again, <laughs> crazy. And each transaction is less than a penny. So why even wait around for something when there's a solution that's viable right now? So that's just my personal opinion. For sure. And I don't know if you've dove into it at all, but Wormhole, the actual bridge for Solana, I find yeah. uh, really intriguing. I don't really know anything about it. I'm not sure if you've really seen much of it. But actually bridging. Yeah. So it's for bridging across blockchain. Um, like, oh, so okay. Solana to Ethereum or say Tezos or something. But um, I guess that's something they've been working on and actually have in place. Okay. I don't know if it's being used yet, but really fascinating because as soon as you're sure. crossing chains, mm -hmm. that really opens up a lot, a lot of questions, of course, but a lot of opportunity as well to right, right. Um, suddenly say, oh, everything has to be Ethereum. Oh, well, we can actually move this to Ethereum if you, if you must. Like, it's yeah. really interesting. Definitely, definitely. And yeah, so Chainlink, is another kind of alternative that is uh, suggesting uh -huh. that they'll be doing the same. And it, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's something that really I was exposed to when I met Crypto Novo in Miami. He told me that and he's been in the game for a while and he's been uh, on Ethereum. And so he mentioned that. So it's kind of like this game of when, what is your timeline, right? So for us, it's like now, like we want to release something now and there's Solana, it's working. But even for ourselves, we definitely plan on having future collections as well. And our target is to be on Ethereum because that's where the, the big blue chip collections are. And a lot of those really true and blue NFT con collectors refuse to go on any other blockchain. And that's just the reality of it. So either you can 
try to convince them to come or you can kind of join them. So Ethereum, I'm still very bullish on. It's just, I just think the, the, you know, maybe the three to six month timeline is not ideal, but like you said, the longer term view, which who knows might be a couple of years out or, or maybe even longer of just everything joining together. I, I totally agree with you there, but it's just like, are you going to sit around and wait two years for something to happen? Because I think a lot of projects did wait for Ethereum 2.0. And I think they really paid the price of just, uh, you know, not being able to release and the saturation kind of happening. Yeah, for sure. So when you were moving over, not moving to Solana, but choosing Solana then, sort of what were your, from a development standpoint, like first uh, initial steps to like figure out, okay, how do I want to do this? Did you have any, uh, you have, uh, what is it called? Open Zeppelin for Ethereum. Is there any sort of toolkit or anything that you found that you found really valuable? Yeah, definitely. And, and the big one is Metaplex. So Metaplex, and you can go to, I think it's just metaplex.com. Mm-hmm. So they were a spinoff of the original Solana Foundation. So they just specifically were focused on helping developers. So they have a Discord. The mods are awesome in there. They're always happy to answer questions. Lots of documentation. And what really stuck out that I mentioned earlier is they are basing it on React. And React is such a common library. So if you are working as a developer, as a day job, it's not like, oh, learn this new programming language or you know, you need to learn that. Uh, we originally, uh, a lot of the collectors that I know, they were on Cardano and Cardano was the hype thing in late summer. Everything was on Cardano, was flipping 5, 10x. So that was the hot thing. And so it was a combination of the toolkit that was available, but then also the user experience. Because when I did mint a couple of times on Cardano, it would say, you minted and it would take my money. But then they would say, you didn't actually get it and we're going to give you a refund. And for me, that just created all this anxiety of like, are they running away with my money? And when do I get it? But the beauty of Solana is if you mint and it takes money from your wallet, you're going to get the NFT and you're going to get it really quick. So like just seeing that when it happened the first time, even though it was eternal beings, and it was a <laughs> flop, just the experience was so smooth. And I'm like, this is how it should be. I shouldn't have to pay a ton of money in gas. I shouldn't have to wait too long. I want it now. I paid, so I want it now right so uh with anything you you buy something online your order goes through and then they're going to ship it to you right rather quickly so same sort of experience but then kind of going back to the metaplex they provide a toolkit they have a a repo that you can find on github so you pretty much take the code and you can kind of uh it just provides you like a foundation so think of it like they give you a box of Legos and now it's up to you to stack the Legos and maybe add some customizations and boom, like, there you go. You have a minting site and they have plenty of documentations. And like I said, they have a discord and they're, you know, any kind of specific questions you have, they're happy to answer. So I'm going to jump right in here. The secret word for this episode is Duke Duke. That is D O O K D O O K. Again, the secret word is Duke Duke. All one word, all lowercase, no spaces. Back to the show. Yeah, and just just for my uh, curiosity, is yeah. were you going the uh, generate upon mint, or did you sort of upload all to IPFS? Like, do you have sort of a, a preference yeah, on that? We uploaded to Airweave. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we uploaded to Airweave and it was a little tricky to be honest. So that's the one thing, the growing pains of kind of anything that becomes hot is the network gets congested. So there are some ways to kind of work around that. You can kind of get your own custom network. And that's only like, there's multiple providers, but the provider I found was only nine bucks a month. Oh, wow. Pretty <laughs> negligible, right? So you can do some little things to kind of help the performance. But yeah, just waiting on the upload takes quite a bit of time. Sometimes you have issues. And um, with something that's kind of on the cutting edge, there's not always every little thing documented. So for example, uh, this first launch that I had mentioned was pixel art. Mm -hmm. So as you can imagine, pixel art is not very large file size. And so our files were under 20 KB and we didn't realize that the minimum that it needed to be was at least 20. So I kept getting an upload error and I'm like, what the heck? Like I'm, I'm doing everything right. This is the command. You know, I have my metadata looks good. And that's just like, you know, asking a bunch of questions, checking things off. 
And then you realize that. And then once I got past that, I realized you also need your file size dimensions to be at least 520 by 520. And ours was like, I don't remember, but 400 something. And it's just like, it just wouldn't work. And it doesn't kind of give you those descriptive kind of error messages that you would get on a mature platform developing for anything else. So a lot of it is trial and error, but that's kind of what you get. If you want to be early in the space, then that's kind of the cost that has to be paid. Yeah, for sure. And that is the beauty also of you having the Astro Dev section in Psyduck Discord because you've yeah. you've sort of hit these, uh, not roadblocks, but just stumbling blocks, I guess. And so you sure. already have that experience to sort of help someone along that path because those are the the errors that like as a developer, you're always just like ripping your hair out. Like what is happening right now? <laughs> yes, yes. And it's, and it's tougher because on Solana, when you're doing these uploads, like every NFT that is processing, it's slowly taking a little bit out of your account. So you're like, if this Ooh. screws up, like I, did I just lose all my money and like, what's going on? Cause it's, you know, like I said, it's like a, a dollar or two per NFT. So like this collection of like, you know, even 700 and it, it was crazy because I was talking to devs in the Metaplex Discord and someone's like, oh man, my 5,500 collection's not working. I'm like, oh man, like I'm sweating over here <laughs> over mine. And, you know, you have like 20 soul up. That's, you know, hopefully it works out, man. Yeah. But so, so that's kind of the anxiety, but the team's been doing really well. They were also in Miami. They had a, a, a hacker house and, nice. you know, they found sponsors and stuff. So seeing stuff like that is encouraging that they're very aggressively, you know, working to build out their community. They have office hours where you can go and ask specific questions from the devs that built it themselves. So everything is available. It's just one of those things that's not going to be this nice document that's like written perfectly. Like I've done mobile app development on uh, iOS devices and yeah, Apple is amazing at their documentations, but also we know how saturated the mobile apps are for iOS. When something's super mature, there's an app for everything. There might be 10 apps for everything. So the NFT space is getting saturated, but not quite that much in Solana at least. Yeah, for sure. So would you recommend someone that from a similar background as you, uh, as a developer and knowing, um, Let's, I mean, let's say someone who is like a full-time software developer, yeah. would you recommend um, Solana is the way to go? You sort of dabble and, and try different things or are, is, is there any maybe like pros and cons that someone should consider? Yeah, definitely. So again, going back to kind of Cardano. So one of the things that was problematic was not only the user experience, but also being able to develop, excuse me, um, because there wasn't many people that knew how to do it. I don't, I don't quite remember what the language was, but it was like... Is that one Rust or not Rust? No. Uh, Rust is... I think Solana is written in Rust. Okay, and yeah. Solidity, yeah, Solidity is Ethereum. So that's yeah. the other issue with Ethereum um, where it's in Solidity and uh, there's some problems with that, but Rust is a little bit newer and it's more... Um, I guess, backed and more modern um, than others. But even for myself, I didn't need to know Rust. I was able to just use these Legos from Metaplex and just kind of build with those. But to answer your question, it really depends on a lot of variables. It's kind of hard to kind of pick because you're also going to have to receive the funds for your launch in that coin. So yeah. if you think the coin is going to go to crap, then probably you shouldn't, you know, create your launch on that. Right. So it depends on that. It depends on, um, the community as well, because we've had to educate our community on how to create a Solana wallet and how to do that. So if you're not an expert on that, or you don't want to be an expert, then you probably want to go to something else. And right? thankfully so, phantom is a beautiful ex wallet. Exactly. Like, exactly. It's yep. such a beautiful experience compared like MetaMask is fine. Like it does, it does the job, yep. but I, I love phantom. Um, yeah, but again, I agree. yeah, people jumping across, they haven't had any experience with it at all. So they might think, Oh, how do I buy this using my MetaMask wallet? Exactly. I get that all the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even for our giveaways when we're like, all right, like send your address and we'll send you the NFT that you won. And I get a MetaMask wallet. I'm like, no, I actually need a Solana <laughs> wallet if you want this. But yeah, there's pros and cons. So even though Phantom is great, they haven't yet released their mobile app, right? So oh, to yeah. people that 
want to be on mobile, that's not an option yet. I think there's Soulflare wallet, which is a, a Solana based wallet, but I haven't heard a ton of good things about that. And I okay. think everyone is waiting for Phantom, but that'll be released uh, January from, from what I've heard oh, them nice. announce. So it's, again, it's, it's really the timing. So even Cardano, uh, when we started our project again, like late September, Cardano was just releasing their smart contract stuff um, to kind of improve that experience. So if a developer is starting now, maybe you could wait for Cardano because again, Cardano is a much more affordable coin. So obviously with Ethereum, it's so expensive. And as a result, it's a fraction of a coin, but you'll never really remove that perception of it's expensive or it's cheap. Yeah. Right. So you have to take that into consideration. Right. So if you look at a company like Tesla, Tesla or Apple, they've intentionally split their stock price for that perception that it's more affordable, although you're just getting a more diluted share. Mm. So I think you have to be mindful of all of those. But again, like I'm biased. I really like Solana. I think it kind of is the best overall. Obviously, it's still kind of new. And so for that reason, I think people are still learning about it. So that's kind of the one kind of con. The other con of Solana, to be honest, is because it is so easy. I think a lot of, you know, bad actors have taken advantage and there's, I, I wouldn't say there's a proportionately high number of scams on it, but that's the perception, unfortunately, yeah. at the moment, because it's new and there has been a significant number of scams where Ethereum has been around for so long and it has a track record of amazing launches that have done really well. So it doesn't have that perception, right? But then with Ethereum, you're paying the high gas fees and um, all that stuff. So it's it's really choosing what's best for you and what you're comfortable with. Because for me, I didn't know any of, I didn't know Solidity. I didn't know Rust. So there's someone out there and they know some of those things. I mean, dive right in. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, and you have to actually then list on the marketplaces too, right? Because I feel like, like OpenSea sort of, um, arguably just sort of happens. But yeah. um, with uh, Solana, from what I understand, it's a little different. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, really good point. So OpenSea is like the de facto mm -hmm. on Ethereum. And that's like probably the most, that is the most well-known marketplace period. But obviously they're really just selling for Ethereum. Where on Solana, there's a numerous marketplaces that are available. There's Magic Eden, there's Alpha.Art, uh, Salon Art. So there's so many. And there's pros and cons to that as well, right? You can choose which marketplace you want to use, right? Um, competition is good. It should spark innovation, but it also can provide a different kind of experience that, you know, for example, for us, we got on digital eyes first. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, people really didn't like that. They're like, when, when Magic Eden, when are we mm -hmm. going to get on Magic Eden? And they're just kind of zoned in on that. So then we're constantly filling out forms with each marketplace so that this person is happy, that person is happy because each one has different features. So, you know, there is no perfect solution. We're happy to, you know, process the paperwork if it makes our community have more choices, but then kind of it's hard for a user that's going to buy off the secondary market because it's like, okay, let me see the inventory on Magic Eden. Let me see the inventory on Solana. And yeah, they're all they're different of, listings, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Because you can only list on one at a time. Mm -hmm. So that kind of makes it difficult. And even for ourselves, you know, if we're just curious to see, okay, like what are the current number of listings and kind of get metrics, it just kind of makes it a lot more work to maintain. So I, I guess that's the difference. And, you know, we haven't talked about Tezos much. So I learned a little bit about Tezos, but I believe they only have one NFT marketplace at the moment. I think it's called Object. Yeah. Yeah. With Ticket when, Nunk sort of going away. Yeah. yeah Object is yeah. like the one now. Yep. Yep. So even with them, like they're about $5 or so a coin. So that seems to be more affordable, but I haven't checked out their tools and things like that. But based on talking to the developer that I met at the conference, I was hearing a lot of good things. They have tools to uh, allow creation of a DAO. Um, oh, nice. And that's kind of very big in the NFT space to allow folks to obviously be a member of the DAO. So a decentralized autonomous organization, uh -huh. I believe it's called. <laughs> yeah. So if you can you know, get verified that you are in fact a holder, you get kind of voting rights similar to how you would if you're a shareholder of a company right so they kind of provide the tools to be able to allow the creators to um 
create a DAO very easily, I was told. So um, it's just a lot. I think I think someone needs to do a little, if they want to create a project, you have to do a little bit of uh, research to pick which ones resonate with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know if you came across the Mike Shinoda drop recently on Tezos, but um, Mike Shinoda is from the band Lincoln, Lincoln Park, and now he has all of his other yeah, own yeah. projects. Um, yeah. But it was interesting because at that launch, like Tezos is fast. It's low, yeah. like cheap for gas and everything. Yeah. It crippled the network. And from what I understand, it was a node. Like they were using like one node, essentially routing all the minting through the one. So then that meant, okay, it became overloaded. Have you come yeah. across anything similar on Solana where there is almost a breaking point still of sorts? Because I mean, we're hitting that with everything, with Ethereum, with everything. Yeah, no, good point. I think the only time we saw a hiccup was, like I mentioned, when we were trying to upload, mm -hmm. just because it's such a large batch that you're adding. And I think that was more of an issue getting things onto Airweave, because Airweave is used to host not only um, files for NFTs on Solana, but it has a lot of just file storage in general that people utilize. So I think that was the big thing. But like I said, for the actual launch, because that's when people are just like yeah. clicking the mint button, trying to get it. And each time they click mint, it is kind of a, a transaction on the network. So as I mentioned, uh, you can sign up for a custom uh, um, network and it's relatively affordable. So I think what I paid for, so I personally, not to not to endorse them, but Quick Note is what I used. Like I said, the, the most basic level was $9 a month and it did 300,000 transactions nice. within that. And I think even on our mint day, it was like, maybe we hit like 50,000. Uh -huh. So, you know, for nine bucks, like not bad at all. So, oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so we didn't get any hiccups. I think um, there was probably some moments here and there, like right when we went live where, you know, we had so much volume that maybe there was a little bit mm -hmm. of a slowdown. But again, Solana is so fast. We're talking about maybe instead of a, a second you're getting your NFT, maybe it's like 20 or something, uh -huh. right? So I, I think it was like relatively negligible for, for the average person. Yeah. So since you're doing, uh, you started with the smaller project um, yes. to sort of uh, as a mint pass and yeah. doing such a high community wallet, because you said 77%. Yes. Um, is there a point, I'm assuming you guys are doing this on the side currently, or are you able to do a full time? Or is there sort of a, a timeline for when you can be full time on it? Yeah, no, great question. The The goal would be, of course, to be full time because this is what I love. And oh, yeah. it's just fun to kind of uh, have your own business and, and be in something that's emerging and what we feel is the future. So that definitely is the goal. But obviously, there needs to be a point that you can see that it is sustainable for you to live off of. Obviously, there's myself and two other co-founders and we have moderators and other people that we need to hire and things like that. So that definitely is the goal. So we want to be able to have a um, royalty that can kind of sustain it. So a lot of the mint revenue is used um, kind of, it's a lump sum, right? So that definitely provides some of the revenue that's needed, but that gets spent relatively quick yeah. because on our roadmap, for instance, we want to explore tokenomics, um, gamification. So we've done some of that. So we were recently put on this gaming platform creatures so that's been really cool um they have their own nft project and they allow other nfts to join and people can it's like a text-based rpg game oh fun so we're happy to kind of jump on that and that's kind of our first dabble in gaming and uh tokenomics because people can earn this token called kin by just playing and training their nft uh for battle so that's <laughs> cool but we want to step in and, and do something bigger on our own as well so whether it's having our own game uh buying land in the metaverse so we haven't gotten too much into the specifics we'll be releasing some information soon but yeah going back to your question it's it's just a matter of what kind of mint, what combination of mint revenue and royalty percentages will allow us to sustain, you know, our uh, personal lives off yeah. of that. It's good. I'm glad to hear you say that too, because a lot of people dive in and they're like, oh, this is like a really long roadmap. I quit my job and doing this, doing this. And yeah. my thought is always, there does need to be a business that goes with this yeah. too. Like it's like a yeah. product first, but the business needs yep. to coincide. So, and you see like the, the really good projects are the ones who are, they've built this business, they've thought long term. And so I'm really glad to hear that like that's that's where you're at because of course, like if you can do this 
like you and the whole team full time. Like this is amazing. Like you're building your own, like essentially your own social network on Discord and this community who it's it's something different, arguably different than any businesses it previous previously because yeah, these are definitely. tight-knit communities that are supporting one another and it's it's just it's a different world and i just i don't know i find it all so fascinating and i really love what you're doing yeah i appreciate that and and yeah you have to because otherwise it just kind of leads to disappointment yeah. obviously if someone is just you know without a job that kind of it's not even so much the money it kind of changes your psyche right it creates panic it increases increases anxiety if mm-hmm. something is not going your way it would create even more panic excuse me a second That's all alexa good. stop <laughs> i don't know what that was sorry about no that, worries yeah so it creates panic it and doesn't really allow you to focus so you know right now i will be honest i'm spending a lot of time a lot of my free time oh, yeah. pretty much all of it outside <laughs> of my my job i'm working tremendously as much as i can but you find ways to have fun too so like you know, starting to get to that point of like burnout, but going to Miami kind of just recharged me quite a bit. So um, I live for that personally, Mm -hmm. that really energizes me seeing how active the community is like every day, we see our community members, you know, comment on other people's tweets, check out Psyducks. And that's just like what I want, right. And not getting that same sort of satisfaction, maybe in the day job. So Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, this was awesome. Like, thanks for coming on and, and sharing the story, well, talking pleasure. about the project. Um, so where should we send people then to uh, check everything out? Yeah, definitely. So I would say just head to our website. So Psyducks.com. So that's S-I-G-H ducks.com. You'll find our links to Twitter. You'll find our links to Discord. And then from there, um, we'll be happy to interact with them and engage with them. I want to thank KJ for joining me on this episode. Be sure to head on over to Psyducks.com. That's S-I-G-H-D-U-C-K-S.com to uh, check out the project and um, find everything about uh, Psyducks. That's very redundant. But but yeah, head on over there and you can see the roadmap Q&A, meet the artists, meet the team, and, and everything about this project. And then that's Psyducks.com. As always... This episode of Starting Now is brought to you by Built. At Built, we help you get started online. Whether you want to start a blog or a business, head on over to built.co. That's B-Y-L-T dot C-O to get started. Built, your website, built for you, simply. Finally, if you're enjoying the show, I'd love it if you uh, subscribe on YouTube, give it a little thumbs up, and leave a comment. All the comments really make my day, and I really appreciate everyone who's uh, commented and sort of joined in thus far. Well, that'll do it for this week. Again, I'm Jeff Saris. This has been Starting Now, and I'll see you next time.